Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2016. Brought to you by headline sponsors, Cisco, IBM, NVIDIA, and our ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Frick and George Gilbert. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are in day three of Big Data NYC. We're going wall to wall. We actually came on Monday to cover some of the artificial intelligence, machine learning activities that are now part of Strata and also now Big Data NYC. And we're really excited to be bringing you the coverage like nobody else does, all day long, all the thought leaders. And our next guest we're really excited to have on, Juan Ho Sun, the co-founder and CTO of Transwarp Technology. Welcome. Thank you, Jeff. So yeah. what are your impressions of the last few days here at the show? Oh, it's uh, also very crowded as last year. So, so many people attending Strata Conference. Excellent. Yeah. And what have you guys been, have you have any uh, new announcements that you want to, that you're bringing out here at the show? Uh, no, not this year. But uh, probably we plan to sponsor like Strata Conference in New York or San Jose. Oh, excellent. This year. So, Yuan Ho, um, Transwarp, it's not familiar, all that familiar to American audiences, but Tell us your, your pedigree in, in, in China in terms of you know, your, your, some of your large customers and how long you've been in operation and you know, so that our, the American audience, the American audience can understand just how big a force you are in China. Okay, so Transform was founded in 2013, so three years ago. Uh, so we are building a company uh, in China. Uh, we have until now, we have uh, about 500 customers. Uh, so they are all deploying Hadoop and Spark. So uh, they are all Spark users, actually, in China. Wow. Uh, okay. and, uh, uh, so we are providing Hadoop distribution to customers in China. But we also build uh, several different products on top of Hadoop, like the first year's uh, database layer on top of Hadoop. So uh, we provide a, a SQL engine. And that SQL engine is compatible with uh, uh, Oracles uh, and DB2s and uh, Teradata SQL extensions, so that uh, so the uh, compatibility level is about 90 percentage, about 90 percentage, uh, so that people can move their uh, like data warehouse workload to our product, and we also uh, have a streaming uh, engine on top of Hadoop, so that streaming engine uh, can support a full SQL uh, as well as PL SQL, uh, so uh, this uh, product is. Uh, use that widely in IoT. Uh, so people use our product to uh, collect the data from sensors, like uh, the wind power generators, so that they can detect the uh, real functions of the generators in real time. Okay, so let's, we'll come back to IoT, because that's at top of mind for everyone. Um, but you know, what, what we found that's interesting here in, in the States with, um, and even in Europe, with Hadoop distributions, most of the vendors provide an MPP, massively parallel processing SQL database, um, as a complementary product. I don't mean free, but you know, as a as an add-on. Um, but these are all uh, sort of new implementations. They're not compatible with customers, you know, existing investments in Teradata, IBM, or or Oracle, um, and so it's usually they're offloading particular workloads like ETL, you know, or they're doing, you know, completely new, new things like the schema on read. How much effort was it for you to keep that compatibility and then what does that allow your customers to do when they migrate, you know, from the legacy systems? Yes, actually in the past or at the present, uh, if they are using uh, uh, Apache Hadoop and uh, they uh, have to use a hybrid architecture. So they uh, combine MPP database together with Hadoop, using Hadoop for ETL, and uh, using MPP database for like uh, interactive analysis or some batch processing. But uh, uh, with our product, our goal is to um, uh, create a one-stop platform so that you do not need to use additional databases. All data is stored in, like, uh, so in one single place and you can uh, run batch processing, uh, you can use uh, uh, our product to do in interactive analysis uh, using one single database. So the data uh, is not uh, copied from one database to another 
When, so when you mentioned that uh, with, with other distributions, typically the customer uses one, uh, one part of Hadoop for the uh, extract, transform, load, um, taking that off the data warehouse, which is you know, running on a data warehouse, very expensive process, and then they have uh, typically do the analysis in an MPP SQL database. Um, the ETL offloader, is that typically done in Hive? Or, or is it done now off, more often perhaps in, in Spark? Um, so uh, if you are using open source uh, projects, then uh, people use it, usually use Hive for batch processing for ETL uh, because it is more stable and scalable. Uh, but uh, with our product, uh, our engine is built on top of Spark. So that means all the batch processing is done using Spark engine. Uh, and uh, uh, again, because we are um, compatible with uh, the Rose uh, traditional databases, uh, single syntax, that means uh, all the ETL logic can be migrated to our platform without any modification, mostly without modification or with, with manual modifications. Uh, and uh, because we on also support distributed transactions, we allow you to insert, update the records on HDFS. That means uh, you can even synchronize the uh, new records or new uh, update from traditional databases to Hadoop in real time. And you can also uh, batch insert or batch update the records on HDFS because uh, we can roll back any uh, failures uh, and we can also maintain the transaction atomic. So, so that's, that's very, you've opened up a, a gazillion questions that I can add, ask, but <laughs> I'm not going to get a chance to on the air, at least right now. Pick, we'll, pick, we'll, some, pick, some, pick some favorites. Okay, you. we'll have to have you back a few dozen more times <laughs> to, to, to actually unpack all that. But um, let me just ask you, when, if you built on, on Spark, um, the concurrency that you would expect from a data warehouse. Spark doesn't have that sort of workload management built in. H how, do you, how do you compensate for that so that many people can be asking queries at the same time? Uh, actually, we, uh, so there are two types of workload. So one is the uh, batch processing kind of workload. That is a t traditional uh, data warehouse workload. So it's uh, uh, so you can uh, submit multiple queries, multiple PLC stored procedures, and we have uh, we actually write a scheduler of a Spark so that uh, we can run these uh, sort of procedures in parallel, and uh, we also do some we call the inter SQL optimizations. We can optimize uh, uh, SQLs, optimize uh, all those stored procedures to find like a common expressions to emulate data codes, uh, and. Uh, uh, we can determine the, the dependency between uh, different SQL uh, statements so that uh, we can schedule these SQL st statements. So this is basically what a compiler typically do. So, this is, what, so th this is what the core of an engine, not the query optimizer, but the other part of a database engine where it says, tell me in what order I'm supposed to do the work so that I can get a lot of work done at the same time. Yes. That's, so, that you've gone and re-implemented that. Yes, we, we uh, write a, a compiler. So that is a distributed compiler for uh, PS SQL. So uh, we can schedule these uh, SQLs. Uh, and and just to way. be clear, PL SQL is the Oracle, Oracle extension to SQL. Right. We, we also uh, support uh, DB2's SQL PL. So that's uh, IBM's extension to SQL. OK. Um, there's a ton of interest in streaming uh, analysis now, and you had touched on Internet of Things. Tell us what your product set looks like there, and then some of the use cases that customers are, are using it for now. Yeah, so uh, our stream product uh, is, uh, uh, we, we are, uh, we are supporting uh, for SQL, for ANSI SQL. That means you can use SQL to create a stream, to connect to Kafka streams, and do any uh, calculation and uh, aggregations. And you can also send alerts using PL SQL on top of streaming. So uh, in this way, we can simplify the uh, streaming application development significantly. Uh, today, if you are writing a, SQL, uh, a streaming application, you can use only a few lines of SQL statements. Uh, in the past, 
or if you are using Spark Streaming or Storm, you have to develop an application. Use, you have to use like hundreds of lines of codes. But uh, uh, with SQL, you only need to write a few lines of SQL statements. So uh, this can simplify the development. Uh, and then uh, the, the second uh, features of our stream product is that we uh, are event driven. So actually, our stream engine is built on top of Spark, uh, but our own version of Spark Core. Uh, but it, it is written in even the driven fashion. So you know Spark Streaming is a mini batch uh, processing framework. That means you have accumulate a few records and do them, process them in a batch. But uh, we are even driven. Uh, we modified the, uh, the communication mechanism inside the Spark so that the, the records can be sent to next stage in real time. That's another few million things I want to unpack. <laughs> but, uh, so, so the but that's like sending George to China uh, yeah. next week. That's an extremely, <laughs> I mean, the, the creator of Spark, Matei Zaharia, who's gone back to academia, that's one of the things he's researching with his students is how to uh, do a, a sort of a lightweight um, core in Spark so that you don't have to always do these micro batch right. um, elements. So yeah, We have done that. Wow. <laughs> So okay. the latency can be significantly reduced to like uh, several milliseconds. You know, Spark Streaming, the latency typically is uh, 300 milliseconds. That's, um, so that's phenomenal. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> tell us, who, who are some of the early customers who are taking advantage of this? Uh, you mean streaming? Yeah. 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 So uh, like one of our typical customers, uh, uh, that is the well, wind uh, power generator farm. So you know, uh, the uh, rose uh, generators are usually installed on mountains or uh, on the sea side. But the, the problem is uh, it's very difficult to uh, maintain these uh, generators. You know, uh, people do not want to go uh, the farm because uh, they're far away from the city. Right. So, uh, and uh, because um, the, the equipment is very pressing, so if there is an, any malfunction, uh, you have to repair it very quickly. So. Uh, uh, you, uh, today in China, there are a lot of uh, wind generators installed. Uh, they have to build a maintenance system. So uh, we call it intelligent maintenance systems so that we can collect all the data from the sensors on the generators. Uh, so the generators will send the sensor data every second. Uh, in one typical customers, uh, they have 10 million sensors. Uh, and the road sensors will send back the data every second. So that means you have 10 million records per second. Uh, and we uh, install a um, uh, Hadoop cluster, actually our streaming cluster, uh, to uh, receive all these events. And you're looking for signals that um, would be predicting failure, um, a f potential failure on, on, a, on a windmill? Yes, there are two use cases. The first is to detect any malfunction in real time so, you, so that you can send alerts uh, very quickly. Uh, the second is we actually do some prediction uh, based, based on the, uh, the vibration of the uh, generator so that we can uh, predict uh, which uh, part will be uh, 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 fail. Will, will fail in the near future. And then do you shut it down at that point? The, the, either the generator or the windmill? Yes, so uh, there is a remote control system so that you can control the generator uh, remotely. You can shut it down or uh, slow it uh, or, uh, or turn it off. To, to minimize the damage. Yeah, to, yes. And, and how much of the system is operating kind of on the mountain in, with the, the wind farm, and how much of that is back at, at a central cloud location, and how do you decide it's, kind of how much data and compute is at each of those locations or yeah. points in between? Yeah, so uh, the distance is usually like uh, uh, 100 kilometers away from the uh, wind farm. So the, the maintenance system is located in city center, actually. So. Uh, the latency between the network is usually like several milliseconds. Um, and the, the data volume is actually huge. So we, we have a cluster of uh, 100 nodes to receive those uh, sensor data. So, and that's, that's in the cloud, or is that? Uh, uh, On-premise. On-premise, yeah. lo locally, near, for the wind farm? 
No, so it's no, remotely like, in like citizen 100 term. kilometers away, oh, 100 and, kilometers. and that's where you've got a cluster of, of compute and store there, right. and then that, can, that connects back. And then is that the same one then that drives back to the control systems yes. uh, as well? Yes. Um, and you said it's like seven, mil, seven um, what was the, the latency again? The latency is uh, like uh, tens of milliseconds. Okay. Uh, it, it usually, uh, so the latency is uh, higher, but uh, we only need to send alerts every second. Within one second, it will be enough. Uh, to, take care of the, to take care of any problems. Yes. And how, how much of the um, 10 million records per second are you, um, well, what type of analysis are you doing near the edge? And then what gets forwarded to the cloud, or does it, does it all get forward, forwarded? So in this case, we didn't process the data in the edge. So we just send all the data back to okay. the center. Uh, but uh, in, uh, for another customers, they, uh, they actually install a um, real-time database called a Pi database in the past. The Raspberry Pi? Yes. Oh, OK. Yeah. So uh, no, uh, no, so it's, uh, uh, I think it's OSI Pi database. It's a very oh. traditional database. Oh. It's a real-time database. So okay. they will store this data in Pi database. And then uh, we will have a receiver to copy the data to a, a data center. So uh, this is uh, deployed in a distributed way. So you have a local, uh, localized database to store the center data. I've got to ask one quick meta question. Most of the major Hadoop distro vendors here, their customers are struggling to get a, ET well, they've, they've pretty much gotten an ETL project off the ground and they're just, dipping their toes in the business intelligence kind of water. You've got IoT applications with, you know, single digit millisecond latency running. Where, where, what, what's the secret sauce? I mean, besides, of course, your generally brilliant self, where, where, how did you guys do this in three years? <laughs> so, uh, actually, it's driven by customers. You know, uh, for the those type of use cases, they push us to achieve that, otherwise they will not buy our product. So we have to achieve that. And uh, it's the pressure from customers, actually. Uh, so uh, for streaming part, I think it is doable because uh, you know there is a existing streaming frameworks like uh, Flink, uh, like Apex, uh, uh, and Storm. So, they, uh, so Storm is even driven, uh, Flink is uh, is also uh, even driven, but it can uh, allow you to develop batch processing logic on top of streaming events. So we actually borrowed ideas from Flink, but uh, we think it's uh, doable on Spark because we uh, we built our products uh, on Spark in past three years, and we think it it made more sense for us to modify Spark to adopt that programming model. So uh, and uh, uh, after several prototypes, we uh, we found it is. Uh, uh, working, so but another part, um, another, another part from Transboy is the SQL engine. Actually, we spent three years to develop the SQL compiler, and uh, it uh, it has more than five million lines of codes today. So uh, we have to do a lot of work to make it compatible with tradi traditional databases, and uh, because our uh, team members uh, they have the background in compiler and operating systems, uh, so. Uh, um, so it, it's actually uh, easier to write a SQL compiler than to develop a distributed C++ compiler. So we, are, we have a quite a lot of C++ compiler experts in our company. So uh, it, it, it's actually easier for us to develop that SQL compiler. Wow. Well, Juanjo, it sounds like you guys are doing all the right things in the right space. Obviously, the IoT angle is huge and, and you know, Renewable energy is growing super, super fast, so um, I'm sure we're going to hear more and more about Transwarp without having to go all the way to China, but I think we're going to send George over to spend some time with you and the team. So thank you for taking a few minutes out of your busy day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Simon. Huh? All right, I'm Jeff Rick. You're watching theCUBE. We are live in Manhattan at Big Data NYC. We'll be back with our next segment after this short break. Thanks for watching.